So we're in this series and it's called On Purpose. Everyone say On Purpose. And the tagline is, my oil ain't cheap. My oil ain't cheap. And I got on a my oil ain't cheap shirt because that's the tagline of the series. And pretty much on purpose means that you are not a mistake. You're not an accident. You wasn't, you, you wasn't made randomly. You know, you, you're not here because of the random act your parents had. Pray for your parents. I'm playing. But you are here on purpose, for purpose, in purpose. And the thing is, the trials and the challenges and the pain that you endure throughout your life is made to, to, is made to cause your oil to be expensive. The oil stands for anointing. Your anointing isn't cheap because as you go through the fire, the pain, and the process of life, it produces new wine, it produces new oil, and it makes you more qualified for the season you're walking to. Because there's always a point between the anointing and the appointing, and that point is process. And God has been processing some of you guys. You've been wondering, why am I going through what I'm going through? The reason why you're going through what you're going through is because God is processing you. Now, before I continue, you guys got to know something. Y'all got to know that I'm a hollerback preacher, which means you got to be like, come on with it, preach that. That's good. You could clap, stand up, whatever you need to do. But you're not going to look at me like I'm a professor because I'm not a professor. I am a preacher. Amen? Okay, let's jump into the word. So today, today, the title of my sermon is, For Such a Time as This. For Such a Time as This. And what happens is in this world, when times are pressing, when times are, when times are challenging, when times are hard, people begin to step back. People begin to get afraid. People get frantic. But here's the thing. You are needed for such a time as this. You are purposed for such a time as this. You are called for such a time as this. In other words, if there was no pain and if there was no trouble, your anointing and your purpose would be irrelevant. It would be unnecessary. It's the trials. It's the trouble that makes your anointing necessary. If there was no Goliath, David wouldn't have been necessary. In other words, if there was no Red Sea, Moses wouldn't have been necessary. It is the adversary that makes you necessary. Let me say it again. It is the adversary that makes you necessary. So in other words, as you go through the pain, the hurt, and the trials of life, you got to remember these things is required to be connected with God. These things are required to be purposed by God. So God uses these trials and these storms and these bad situations to purpose you and put you in the right place at the right time. I want you to know something. You're not here by a mistake. You're here on purpose. This pandemic has purpose. God has purposed you for such a time as this. That there's purpose in this time and you have to be ready and you have to be vigilant and you have to be expecting for what God is going to do. Are you prepared when God calls your card? Let me ask you again. Are you prepared when God calls your card? Because if you're not prepared, you're going to let purpose pass you by. Because purpose will never park. Purpose will always pass. Whenever God was getting ready to do something in the Bible, the purpose never stopped and paused and waiting on anybody. The purpose will pass by. If you're not ready when purpose calls, purpose will pass by. And the thing you got to understand about purpose, there is a time for a purpose. There is a place for a purpose. If you're in the right time in the wrong place, nothing happens. If you're in the right place at the wrong time, nothing happens. But if you're in the right time at the right place everything happens everything changes everything shifts you were made on purpose and you were made for such a time as this God made you in history so you can be ready for destiny you are strategically here you're not a mistake you are not a mistake so one of the things I want you to know before I get ready to jump into the scripture is this that your life is intentional here's what you got to understand as a believer as a believer, we don't walk in luck. We walk in providence. Let me say it again. As a believer, we don't walk in luck. We walk in providence that you was purposed for such a time as this. That God's providence is on this. That you're not here by a mistake. You're not here by an accident. You're not here hearing me preach. Randomly here, God placed you here because God had a word for you in this time, in this season, for this very reason. Come on, somebody. Give God a shout of praise. Give him a shout. So, what you got to understand is, everything is about timing. There's a time and there's a season for everything. There's a time and there's a season for everything. So, if you have your Bibles, go to the book of Esther. Go to the book of Esther. I'm going to read the scripture and then we're going to roll. Go to the book of Esther. Anybody excited to be in the house of God? 
Come on, I say, is anybody excited to be in the house of God? Go to the book of Esther. Esther chapter 4. Let me know when you guys are there, say ready. Awesome, awesome. Esther chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 10. It says, then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal province knows that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner courts without being summoned, the king has put one law that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their life. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. So Esther is here, and she's getting word from her uncle Mordecai, who's like her mentor, who's kind of like her father. He raised her. And what's happening is the king's right hand is a man named Haman. And a man named Haman wanted to kill Mordecai because Mordecai wouldn't bow to him. And the reason why Mordecai wouldn't, Mordecai wouldn't bow to him is because Mordecai is from Israel. And the God of Israel is Yahweh, is Jehovah, is Jesus. And in the children of Israel, we don't bow to images. We don't bow to men. We only bow to God. Because to bow means to worship. To bow means to worship. So Mordecai was saying, if I would bow to Haman, I'm worshiping Haman. And I'm not going to worship Haman because there's only one person that's worthy of my worship. And that's the person that created me. Come on, somebody. Give our king a shout of praise. So Mordecai wouldn't bow. And when he wouldn't bow, you know what? Before I feel like, before I finish reading this, I feel like preaching a little bit. I'm going to stand up. So Mordecai wouldn't bow. And, when, and because he wouldn't bow, Haman was angry. He was mad. He wanted Mordecai and all of the Jews killed. Now, Haman came from a tribe of people that God had told Saul to kill. And when Saul didn't kill and destroy this group of people, now we have a descendant in Haman that's now coming to destroy God's people. In other words, when God asks you to destroy something in your life, He's saying you need to destroy it before it destroys you. You need to destroy it before it destroys you. If you don't deal with your sins, your sins will deal with you. If you don't deal with your wounds, your wounds will deal with you. If you don't deal with your pain, your pain will deal with you. Because if you don't heal from what hurts you, you'll bleed on those that didn't cut you. If you don't heal from what hurts you, you'll bleed on those that didn't cut you. And here's Saul. He wasn't obedient, and he did not deal with this group of people. And now a descendant of this group of people is here trying to deal with God's people. So now Haman wants Mordecai and all the Jews killed. He's the right hand of the king. He's the man in power, and he can do whatever he wants to because the king has given him power and authority. But now Mordecai and the children of Israel, they had a secret card. They had an ace card. And the ace that they had in the hole was Esther. Because Esther was a Jewish woman and she was married to the king. Now what the king did not know is he didn't know Esther was Jewish. Because Mordecai told Esther, don't tell the king that you're Jewish. And the reason why you can't tell the king that you're Jewish is there's an anti-Semitic culture around here. Simply means they're not receptive to Jews. And if the king knows that you're a Jew, if he knows who you are, you may not be able to get in position. Friends, I want to tell you something. Sometimes you need to be quiet. Sometimes you need to hush. Sometimes you need to quit talking because you're releasing stuff on social media that God didn't intend for you to release. There's a time for releasing. There's a season for releasing. There's a purpose for releasing. Because here's what you don't understand. There's life and death in the power of your tongue. And the same way you release that blessing and spoke life there's some haters that's not happy for you and those haters that's not happy for you they're releasing cursing they're speaking negative into your situation they're speaking negative into your family they are speaking death and life and death is in the power of the tongue so the devil starts using people's tongues to curse you but God said I gave you a tongue to bless you speak what I said speak what you read and I am going to heal it so Esther had to be quiet. You got to know the seasons of silence. Because sometimes when you're silent up front, God is working behind the scenes. So Esther was silent. 
And now Mordecai was saying to Esther, okay, everything is changing because your people lives are being required of them. And let's go back to the scripture. Come on, I'm so excited. I love this story. Oh my gosh, I feel like a kid in a candy store right now. It's going to be so good. So it says, so, so now he's saying, hey, go to the king. And it says who the king, it says who approaches the king in the intercourse without being summoned. The king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spare their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to the king. So she was like, hey, I ain't seen the king in 30 days. You know, the king may be a little emotional. Sometimes we good, sometimes we not. And if I go in there, I could be killed. I could come at the wrong time. The king could be doing his kingly stuff. I can be killed. He may not get me the gold scepter. And if he don't give me the gold scepter, I'm going to die. We're talking my life now, Mordecai. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. In other words, he said, baby girl, don't get it twisted. Just because you're in the king's house, if this decree get passed, you're going to die too. Don't get it twisted. Some of you guys are in places of power. Some of you guys are at a job. Some of you guys are in politics and in certain things. And you're sitting there quiet. And God is saying you may need to speak up. Because if you don't speak up in this season, your life may be required of you in the next one. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. In other words, you're not God's only plan. If you stay silent, God's going to fire you and hire someone else. If you don't believe me, you better ask Saul because he was supposed to reign for a thousand years. Saul got fired and David got hired. Come on, somebody. Adam got fired and Jesus got hired. God said, I ain't playing with you. If you don't do the will and the purpose of God on your life, I will use another. So he said it will come from another place. And then it says, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows? Everyone say, who knows? Who knows? But that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Everyone say, for such a time as this. Who knows, Esther, could God have placed you there for this very reason? Could God have placed you there for this very moment? Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews, all the Jews, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. I'm going to do what I got to do. I'm going to do the will of God. If it costs me, it costs me. If I perish, I perish. If I die, I die. But I'm going to do the will of God. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Friends, this is powerful. This is powerful. So anyways, Esther was inside of the king's court. She was the wife of the king. And sometimes when you're in a place of power, you're afraid. And you don't want to say nothing. And there are some seasons where you shouldn't say nothing. But you got to be aware of the shift. You got to be aware of the change. You got to be aware of the season that God is asking you to step out, stand out, and speak up. So now God was asking her to step up. He was asking her to stand out. And at first she was afraid. She said, my life could be taken from me. And he said, don't get it twisted. He said, if you let this decree go through, you are going to lose your life. Could you have been placed there for such a time as this? And my question for you is, could you be in Texarkana for such a time as this? Could you be existing right now for such a time as this? Could you be in the middle of a pandemic for such a time as this? Could you be at that job for such a time as this? Could you be in that family for such a time as this? Because there's a time and a season and a purpose to everything. And I want you to know, don't miss your time. Don't miss your season for such a time as this. Right here in church, I want to declare something to you. By the word of God, God has planted this church for such a time as this with the racial divide happening in the world God says I'm going to unite my church right here in the midst of division with everything that's happening to fear God said I'm going to raise up a church of faith I'm going to where everyone is saying young people don't go to church no more I'm going to raise up a church with young people old people black people white people Hispanic people Asian people because we have been purposed for such a time as this and now we're in position, but we have to know why we're in position. The reason why we're in position is because there's a moment. Life changes in a moment. 
Blessing is released in a moment. Healing happens in a moment. My question for you is, are you missing your Esther moment? Or are you missing your Mordecai moment? Because sometimes God is going to ask you to change it directly. Then sometimes God is going to ask you to change it indirectly. Because Mordecai didn't have the power, but he had the ear of the person with the power. God is saying some people around you may have the ability to do it, but you're going to have to speak truth to power. Because in this season, things are going to shift and they're going to change. And I need you diligent. You were called for such a time as this. I want you to know something. Your purpose matters. Your life matters. You matter. There is a void in the universe waiting on you to step in it. Y'all missed it. There's a void in the universe waiting on you to step in it. You don't have to act like nobody else. You don't have to look like nobody else. You don't have to respond like nobody else because there is space for you. There's room for you. There is a void waiting on you. Come on, somebody. Give our king a shout of praise. Don't miss your Esther moment. You have to be ready when God calls you. You have to be ready when God calls you. And here's the thing you have to understand. When God calls you, there will be opposition. There will be people against you. There would be haters. There will be pressure. How do you know when it's your time? Because whenever it is your time to do something, there will be a spiritual warfare release. There would be a spiritual warfare release. And this spiritual warfare could cost you a lot. But also, if it worked out good, it could pay a big dividend. Yeah. And in other words, there was this warfare that was happening. It was breaking out in the land. Whenever trouble and calamity and certain things start happening around you, you got to look at the position that God has put you in. Yeah. In other words, as the racial divide started rising, I have to look, why am I a pastor in this season? Why am I a pastor? And why am I? Why did God put me in position? Why am I here? Could I be here for such a time as this? Can I be here to heal something? Like Dr. Martin Luther King, there was racial tension, but he was in place for such a time as this. Don't miss your moment. Come on, somebody. Give God a shout of praise. And what you got to realize is you're not there by happenstance. You're not there by luck. You are there by God's providence. God's providence is different from luck. God's providence is God strategically pulling the strings behind the scene to make sure everything happens. Because you got to understand something. How random is it that Esther is married to the king as her people is finna be perishing? So you got to understand, what are you doing? Why are you here? Why has God called you? Let me go on to the, 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 the next part of this story. Let me go on to the next part of the story. So Esther goes to the king. And as she goes to the king, he holds up the gold scepter. He accepts her inside of his courts. And she was so excited because the king didn't kill her. In other words, the king had favor upon her. And, she, and he said to her, anything you want up to half of the kingdom is yours. And she said, I tell you what, I want to have a banquet. I don't want to tell you exactly what I want right now, but I will tell you what I want in due time because timing is essential. Timing is essential. So she did not tell the king what she wanted because if she would have attacked his right-hand man, that could have went wrong. So she said, I want you both to come to the banquet. And she threw a banquet for the king and for Haman. Now, before Haman went to the banquet, Haman went and he built a pole 50 cubits high. And the reason why he built a pole is because he walked past this Mordecai again that wouldn't bow to him. And he said, I'm going to build this pole and I'm going to hang this Mordecai because I'm tired of him disrespecting me. So now he built this pole and he's about to kill Mordecai. But the king was inside of his chambers and he said, hey, read me the documents of the past. They began to read the king the documents of the past. And then he saw where he was going to be killed by two of his assistants. And then this servant named Mordecai was the one that stopped and told what was happening. And he spared the king's life. The king said, whoa, I missed this. I didn't know what happened. And then the king called in Haman. And Haman came and he had favor with the king. He had clout with the king. And Haman and the king said to Haman, he said, what should I do for somebody that has favor in my sight? Mordecai was deceived because God blinded him. And I'm telling you, your enemy will come against you, but sometimes God would blind the eyes of your enemy. So Haman, thinking the king was talking about him, he was like, what should you do for somebody that's in your favor? 
Let me tell you what you should do. You should put a robe on them. You should put them on a nice horse. You should give them a grand honoring. You should do whatever they want. And he made this grand thing because he thought it was for him. I want to tell you something. The same person that came against you is the person that God's going to use to bless you. The same devil that tried to stop you is the same devil that God's going to make your footstool. God said the person that tried to push you down, I'm going to place you on top of. Come on, somebody. Give our king a shout of praise. He said, I'm going to place you on top of devils, serpents, demons, and enemies. I'm going to put you in the place of power. So now Haman, who wanted to hang Mordecai, is the same guy telling the king to bless Mordecai. Why? Because those that try to curse you, God will use to bless you. So now, after he said all that, the king said, go do all of that for Mordecai and don't miss one instruction. Everything you said, I want you to go do for Mordecai. So they went, they put him on a robe, they put him on a nice horse, and they wrapped him up in glory. And he got his life spared that day. He got his life spared. Why? Because God's providence, the perfect timing. He was finna die the next day. But that day, the king remembered the faithfulness and the good things he has done. I'm telling you, you got to be faithful in the yesterday because God will bring that back to today. God will bring to remembrance. God will let your reputation precede you. I'm telling you, you got to be faithful today because it will be your faithfulness today that will reward you and bless you tomorrow. You got to be faithful now and God will bless you next. So, 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 so as the story proceeds, Esther is sitting there and the king is saying, what is your wish? What do you want? Anything up to half the kingdom is yours. And she said, I want my life protected and I want the lives of my people protected. And Haman, your right hand man, has set out to kill us. He's a vow man. And the king was infuriated. He couldn't believe that Haman would try to kill. He would try to kill his wife and her people. And the king was angry at Haman. And the king was mad. You came for my wife. You came for her people. He was furious at Haman. And he was walking. He was pacing. He was so angry. But the same Haman was the guy that made a pole 50 cubits high to kill Mordecai. I'm going to read to you. Then I'm going to start preaching. I'm going to read to you. Let me read this to you. I want to read something to you. Esther 7 and 9. It says, as soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then one of the eunuchs attending the king said, a pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. He had set it up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. I want to preach to you today, and I want to let you know, the same pole that the devil brought to kill you is the same pole God is going to use to kill the devil. The same trap that the devil brought against you is the same trap that God is going to use to promote you. The same trap that the devil brought to kick, take you out is the same trap that God's going to use to take him out. The same pole the devil brought to curse you is the same pole God's going to use to curse him. See, what the devil don't understand is he worked for God on his best day because that Goliath that you bought was promotion to David's destination. That furnace that you brought was promotion to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's destination. I want to tell you something. Daniel, that lion's den was promotion promotion to your destination. That Red Sea was promotion to your destination. God says what the enemy brought against you, I'm going to use against him. That's why God said the weapon may form, but it won't prosper. The reason why God lets the weapon form is so he can use it on the enemy. I'm telling you, God lets the weapon form because the weapon won't prosper against you, but it will prosper against the devil. That's why the cross was formed. The cross wasn't formed to take Jesus out. The cross ain't what killed Jesus. The cross is what killed Satan because that's the cross that set me free. That's the cross that saved my sins. That's the cross that brought me my redemption. Oh, come on, somebody. Give a king a shout of praise. What the enemy brought to kill you, God will use to kill him. Okay, you don't believe me? Goliath came, and he had a sword that he was going to kill David with. 
David didn't kill Goliath with a stone. He knocked him out with a stone. The Bible says that David went with his sword and cut off Goliath's head. The same sword he brought to kill David is the same sword that David used to kill him. My God. My God. I'm telling you, for such a time as this, devil, you can't hold me back. Devil, you can't stop me. Why? Because what you're doing is producing new wine. It's producing new wine. And why is wine significant? The reason why Jesus' first miracle was wine, let me show you. Because wine took a process. Wine took a process. In other words, you would have to grow those grapes for two years. Then you would have to process them into wine. It took time. Jesus showed up on the scene and said, give me that dirty water. Fill the buckets. And in a moment, Jesus turned water into wine. I'm telling you what it would take most people two years to get to. God is going to do for you in a moment. God is going to turn that water into wine. God is going to turn that storm into a great story. God is going to turn that pain into purpose. God is going to turn that worry into worship. God is going to turn that pain and all of that anxiety into your blessing. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you, my great mess will be my great nest. My greatest struggle will be my greatest story. My test will be my testimony. I'm telling you, my change will be my blast off place, my takeoff place, my releasing place. God is about to launch some of you guys to the next level. For such a time as this. And you got to understand something. In this time, you have to be ready. And it's not casual. It is personal. It's personal. In this time, it is personal and what the devil tried to use against you God is going to allow you to use against him there was this man and this man was at the YMCA and you know people in the YMCA that play basketball they kind of retired they kind of old you know what I'm saying they limping across the court they tired they're halfway playing but this particular man he ran hard every play he played hard every play he didn't take a playoff. He was drenching in sweat. He would run back and forth. When they were sitting on timeout, he was standing. And they was like, what is wrong with this man? Why does he play with such intensity? Why does he play with so much stamina and so much zeal? And after the game, they had to ask the man. They said, sir, we see you running up and down the court. We see you jumping. We see you not taking a playoff. We see you playing with such passion. We see the tears dropping out your eyes. What is going on? Why do you play like that at the YMCA? You're not in the NBA. Hey, what's happening? And he came and he looked at them. And he said, y'all don't get it. He said, look at my two legs. What do you notice about them? They say, your legs are skinny. They're like little sticks, hockey pucks. Hockey sticks. Skinny legs. Real skinny. No calf. He said, let me tell you why my legs look like that. He said, seven years ago, I was at 7-Eleven hanging out, and two people got into it. One man started shooting, and instead of his bullet hitting the other guy, it hit me in my spine. And I've been paralyzed for five years, not able to walk and not able to stand. And in a dream, God said, if I gave my life to him, he'll heal my legs. And I could walk again. And I would walk with purpose. I would walk on purpose. I would walk with passion. And God healed my legs. So as you guys are out here jogging and lollygagging and standing around, this may be casual for you, but this is personal for me. Because I couldn't walk five years ago. I couldn't stand five years ago. I couldn't move five years ago. And these legs that the devil tried to take from me is these same legs I'm going to use to bless God. Or these same legs I'm going to use to give God glory. Or these same legs I'm going to use to move God's kingdom forward. I'm not doing this casually. I'm doing this personally. And I want to tell you something. God, God, God allow me to be saved the devil tried to abort me oh the devil you should have left you should have took my life then because my life will be used for the glory of God my life will be used for the kingdom of God my life will be used for the will of God my life will be used for the purpose of God devil you should have got me when you could have now it's too late I am standing with my king 
This is not casual. This is personal. That's why every time I touch a microphone, I'm going to preach like I'm a dying man, talking to dying people because I was supposed to die. But God spared me. And because of God spared me, this is not casual. This is personal. I'm telling you, you got to fight the devil sometimes personal. And the reason why you can fight the devil personal is you don't fight him in your strength. You fight him in God's strength. Because God said the battle is the Lord's. Last time I checked, my king is undefeated. Last time I checked, my king is undisputed. Last time I checked, my king never loses. I'm not going to let nobody stop me from worshiping my God and blessing my king. Why? Because my king died for me. Not only did he die for me, he rose for me. Not only did he rise for me, he bled for me, saved me, redeemed me, healed me, put favor and blessing on me, put a new robe and a coat of many colors on me. I'm going to bless God all the way. I know I'm acting up in here. I know, I know my white congregants are like, what is wrong with him today? Pastor Tess, quit giving him Kool-Aid. In other words, God is saying, for such a time as this, for such a time, you have been called for such a time as this. And then the word says, God will prepare a table in the midst of your enemies. Now, as I prayed last night, I said, God, why do you prepare a table in the midst of our enemies? He said, because I'm going to feed you in front of who starved you. I'm going to bless you in front of who cursed you. I'm going to elevate you in front of those that de-elevated you. I'm going to promote you in front of those that demoted you. I'm going to heal you in the presence of those that hurt you. I'm going to give you purpose for the pain they cost you. I'm going to prepare a table in the midst of your enemies. And in the ultimate kiss of death, you're not going to use the table to tease them. You're going to use the table to feed them. Because God said, bless those that curse you. My God. My God. God is saying, I am going to use you. I'm going to do something amazing. I'm going to do something new. And the reason why you're going through this test is for the testimony. The reason why you have a testing of your faith is because it produces perseverance. The more crushing, the more pressing, the more wine that's released. God is saying in the crushing, in the pressing, in the pain, in the pandemic, in the distress, I am doing something new inside of you. God is saying in order for you to walk in what I'm calling you to walk in, you're going to need two things. You're going to need new wine and new wine skins. The wine is the content. The skin is the container. The container is your mindset. God is saying you're going to have to shift your mindset in this season because that old way of thinking, that old way of walking, and that old way of talking, that yesterday mindset won't work in tomorrow's future. You're going to have to have a new mindset. You're going to have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because I'm doing a new thing. And when I do a new thing, it requires a new mind. Now, when I do a new thing, it also requires new wine. New wine. And new wine comes from testing, from fire, from trying, from pressing. That's why everyone great in the Bible had a trial. Last week I said, it ain't because you can do it that you're called, it's because you can stand it. In other words, my oil ain't cheap. My oil ain't cheap. My oil ain't cheap. My oil cost pain. My oil cost trial. My oil cost abandonment. My oil cost betrayal. Okay, watch this, watch this. Watch this. Some of you guys are praying it away. Some of you guys don't want to go through it. Some of you guys don't want it to happen. But watch this out. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Everybody you know in the Bible is because of pressing. Everybody you know. David is most known for Goliath, the pressing. Goliath was what Satan used. Because here's what God does. Here's what God does. God says, before you go to the next level, you have to be battle tested. Because what's not tested can't be trusted. So here's what God does 
to get rid of imposers and counterfeits. God put booby traps in front of destiny. In other words, everybody that tries to walk the path of purpose will fall in the booby trap. Let me prove it to you. Joseph in the coat of many colors. As he was walking towards his dream, he fell in the pit. He fell in the prison before he got to the palace. As David was working and being faithful in the field, he was going to take his brother some cheese and some bread. That's pizza. He was taking his brother some pizza, right? And as he was minding his business, there was an uncircumcised Philistine taunting the armies of God. In other words, there was a blessing that, 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 that the king said, whoever defeats this giant will acquire. In other words, there was a lot of imposers out there. There was a lot of counterfeits. The giant was to make sure it didn't get in the wrong person's hands. Daniel inside of the lion's den. God said, I need somebody that won't bow to the things of this world. I need someone that'll stand. They won't bow. I want their worship. I'm worthy of their worship. I'm a jealous God. I'm the only person that can have their worship. And I need somebody that cannot be persuaded against me. So when many would probably get ready to go into the lion's den, at that point of breaking, they would curse God. But God needed a man that would go through the lion's den because on the other side of the lion's den was the destiny, was the purpose, was the anointing. Many never made it to and through the lion's den. It was a booby trap to get rid of imposters. And Daniel went through the lion's den and he inherited what God had for him. Oh, you guys don't believe me. Let me show you some more. You guys ain't believing me. Let me show you some more. We need some more. See, there's a difference between our God and the other gods. Because there was a booby trap called death. And the other gods was unable to walk through death and come out of it. But our God is a little different. Because he walked through death, hell, and the grave. And he walked through it. And he came out of it to show us those other gods was a counterfeit. They were imposters. Buddha couldn't do it. Muhammad couldn't do it. Confucius couldn't do it. Only Jesus can do it. He went through the trap. He made the test of time. I want you to know something. What was supposed to be your termination was your transportation to your destination. What was supposed to be your termination was your transportation to your destination. Let me say it again. What was supposed to be your termination was your transportation to your destination. What the devil brought to kill you is what God was going to use to promote you. My God. My God. You know what? I'm going to save this next point to next week. I'm going to say this next where Brandon can come up. I'm going to save it to next week. Because y'all ain't ready for it. The anointing requires fire. It requires pressing. It requires testing. See, the anointing, let me show you what it means. The anointing is the releasing of oil. Oil, oil, oil. I know a lot about oil because I gained 30 pounds. And in gaining 30 pounds, oil became my best friend. Because I couldn't wear my wedding ring without no oil. See, my wedding ring wouldn't fit on my finger when I gained the weight. Sometimes you're walking into things you can't fit in. You're struggling. You're trying to push through. And God said, I'm going to pour oil on you so you can slide through what's resisting you. And the reason why it's so tight is to eliminate everybody that don't supposed to go through it. So I'm anointing the one that is supposed to pass by. So everyone else can't fit it. They can't put the ring on. Only the one that has the oil. And God is saying, I'm putting oil on your head so you can go to that university. Many tried, but many failed. I'm putting oil on your head so you can go back inside of your family and bring healing. I'm putting oil on your head so you can raise up those kingdom kids that'll be world changers and city shakers. God is saying, I'm putting oil on you so you can slide through the next dimension. The oil was to give you the ability to slide through. Here's the second thing the oil was designed to do. The shepherd would come and the sheep would have bugs biting on their ears and on their hands. And the sheep would go crazy. They would run their head into the fence. These things were trying to destroy them. And then the shepherd would pour oil on their head. 
And the oil would cause the enemy to slide off. I'm telling you, when the devil comes for you, he ain't going to be able to touch you. He ain't going to be able to grab you. He ain't going to be able to hold you because the oil. The oil. God said he will anoint your head with oil. I'm telling you, your cup, run it over. For such a time as this, you have been called. There's a time and a season for every purpose under heaven. You have been called for this season. You have been purposed for this season. You have been anointed for this season.